The recipe that I'm using is called a quick 30 minute mozzarella. So it easily fits into the presentation. So I won't even go that fast. There'll be some times when I'm talking and it's just sitting there and we're talking and I'm doing other things. So it, it'll stretch out a little bit. Um, but this recipe is something that anybody could do at home with milk. Now, I, I will qualify that statement. All right? The milk that I'm using here, this is actually um, our, our goat milk. So this is fresh goat milk that was just milked, uh, I don't know, a couple days ago or so. So this is what would be classified as raw milk. Now, the um, kind of hard to get in the store. In fact, I don't think you can get, well, you can't anywhere. And that's one of the things that I will talk a little bit about is the whole, you know, raw milk versus pasteurized milk issue. Um, so when I say that, you can do this at home with any milk, I got to qualify that by saying it must be either raw milk or milk that has not been ultra pasteurized. Most of the milk, uh, especially if you're like, oh, I want to do organic, you know, most of the organic milk uh, in the store is ultra pasteurized, which means it's been heated to like 270 degrees under a very high pressure so that it doesn't boil and it just literally kills everything in it. But at that high a temperature, it also does some damage to the milk proteins and the enzymes and everything else that's in the milk. I mean, 270 degrees will kill everything. And I, in my opinion, it, it kills the milk too. So I mean, it's just, well, yeah, it would, <laughs> it would. So point being, that type of milk will not, I repeat, will not make cheese. Now, pasteurization itself is still something that is, is you know, required for most milk that is sold in the stores in Illinois. Um, so you're not going to be able to go by the, to the store and buy raw milk in Illinois. The fact is, the, the way the regulations are right now is the only way you can buy raw milk is actually go to the farm with your own container and get the milk there. Now, there are um, some dairies in the state, and, and right now, based on where I live, which is, is further south, I know of only one dairy that actually um, sells milk that is what we call VAT pasteurized, V-A-T. So for that, you heat the milk up to about 145 degrees, you let it sit for half an hour. So that is the lowest temperature at which you can pasteurize. And so that milk is fine for making cheese, including the mozzarella that I'm going to be making today. Um, the, the farm is it's called Kilgus, uh, K-I-L-G-U-S. Um, they sell at a variety of stores in the area where I live. I know that uh, they sell it in Pontiac. Uh, I believe they have some in um, Chinoa, or no, not Chinoa, Fairmont. No, what's it? Fairberry. I knew I'd get the word right. Fairberry is actually where they're located. So you could actually go to their farmstead and buy it there as well. But that's, I know that's a ways from here. Um, I'm just not sure what is in the area here. Mo a lot of health food stores might carry something that is not you know, high temperature pasteurized. Um, so that's a possibility as well, you know, if you want to make on your own. Now, that having been said, and I'll, I'll probably talk more about that as we go through as well. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to go ahead and, and kind of get this started. So what I have here is a thermometer, and this particular thermometer is a nice digital, you know, bright red with an extendable thing, and you don't need anything that fancy. You can just do it with any, any standard food thermometer works just fine, um, you know, as long as you can read it, which is <laughs> getting a little harder these days to, to read those little bitty numbers. Yeah, that's what the glasses are for, right? All right, so, so basically the ingredients that you need to actually make the cheese that I'm making, which is the mozzarella, is the milk. I will be using citric acid. This is in powder form. And I will be using rennet, which I left in the fridge down the hall. So I don't need it yet. I can run and get it in a second. Or, nope, can't. Okay, yeah. All right, so I knew I forgot to get something. <laughs> and rennet. So I'll go, I'll go get to rennet here in just a second once I get this going. Uh, I'm going to be using a glass bowl to hold the cheese while I'm heating it up. And Today I'll be using a microwave, just because that is one of the things that helps speed this process along. But while I'm doing that, I'll also talk about other ways 
to do it you know, without using a microwave. I know if, if anybody who was in the uh, um, off-grid talk that Victoria did earlier this morning, she doesn't have a microwave. So we were talking earlier about you know, different ways to do it, and, and I've known how to do it, and this is a way that she'll do it as well um, without a microwave, but it's quicker with the microwave, in my opinion. So right now you can see the temperature of the milk is about 47 degrees. All right, I've had it sitting out here for a little bit, so it's warmed up a little bit uh, from the fridge. Okay. So the um, general process is basically I'm going to heat the milk up to 55 degrees, and I'm going to add my citric acid. Now what I do with the citric acid is I actually dissolve that in a little bit of water. And the nice thing about this recipe is it's very forgiving. Uh, Deborah has done this demonstration in a lot of different places, and one time she just blanked and, and took the citric acid and sprinkled it right into the milk. That's fine. It works. <laughs> I'm just out of habit, I just do this, and it helps provide a better distribution and everything as well for that purpose. So half a tablespoon, half a tablespoon of citric acid for one gallon of milk, which by the way is what I'm starting with there for one gallon. So right now I'm just using a little electric hot plate, so I'm basically going to start heating the milk right now. When it gets to 55 degrees, I'll go ahead and add the citric acid. And just as a note, the, uh, we do have some cheese making supplies that are available in the bookstore, which includes the citric acid. There's also a mesophilic starter, which I'll talk a little bit about later, as well as rennet. Okay. So we'll have all that available uh, in the bookstore. So I'll basically just go ahead and, I don't know where that came from. I always hate it when little random black things show up in there. It's like, where'd that come from? Citric acid is a uh, common food additive. Um, I know I've used it for like when you can tomatoes. It, it is um, basically uh, the, the acid that is in a lot of our fruits, like, you know, uh, Lemon juice has citric acid in it, things like that. So this is in powder form, um, which again we will have for sale out there. And it's often used as a preservative. Right. Yeah, and that's why I mentioned for canning purposes, especially with uh, things that are low acid, uh, like tomatoes. Uh, I know with um, when I make tomato sauce, you add like I think not much, it's like a quarter of a teaspoon for a pint. You know. So it's the least natural thing I think <laughs> that we have. All right, so that's all. Oh no, it's not poured in because it's not. Uh, all right, we're going up. Okay. Yeah, vitamin C is. Uh, I thought that was ascorbic acid. It is ascorbic acid. Yeah. Yeah. In, in dried form, this lasts forever. I mean, we, you know, we just we pour out enough in here and we buy it by the pound. So if it's in a plastic bag, we just reseal it until we need to refill that. We make a lot of mozzarella. Yeah. <laughs> so as that's heating up, sometimes you know, I'll just go ahead and interject some other things you know, that, um, uh, with regard to cheese. So I'll talk about a lot of different cheeses here because you know, it's really kind of boring to just sit here and you know, watch milk heat up. Okay. Now, in general though, Cheese has been around for a lot of years simply because that is a nice, easy way to preserve milk. So milk itself won't stay fresh for more than a week or so, you know, depending on, you know, fresh milk, I should say. Obviously, one of the reasons they do ultra-pasteurization is because that'll have a shelf life of months, which is really scary when you think about it. Makes you wonder what's left in that food if it's going to last for that long. It's kind of like the, what is it, the video or um, the documentary uh, Super Size Me where they leave out the, the fries for months and nothing happens to them. It's like, just makes you wonder. <laughs> so with, uh, with milk and everything, cheese is a natural way to make it last. Now mozzarella that I'm making today, that is a fresh cheese. And so it is not going to be something that is aged or can be kept for a very, very long time. Now, what we do, though, is we make a lot of it while we have milk, and then we vacuum seal it and freeze it. So again, um, you know, that will make it keep. Um, but other types of cheese, especially the aging cheeses, those were designed that they could be kept uh, typically in a 
cave, right? The whole concept of a cheese cave is basically some underground area or some area that stays at a relatively constant 50 to 55 degrees all the time, and the cheese will literally last for years in there. How are we doing here? Okay, almost there. I, guess. I have to turn it so I can see it, I guess. <laughs> there we go. Um, I can start to smell the hot plate. <laughs> it's like, oh yes, it's warming up. Um, but the, um, a lot of the aged cheeses are designed, or not designed, but they will keep at 50 to 55 degrees literally for years. And so that is the way to basically uh, kind of store all the nutrients, or at least densify the nutrients and store them and keep them long after they would have expired or, or gone bad um, as milk. All right, so we're, yeah, that's close enough. 54 degrees here, so I'll go ahead and add the citric acid in. And the nice thing about this, this, this particular pot, and talk about some of the things that I'm using here. This particular pot is a uh, very thick bottom, and the reason I like that is it helps distribute the heat a lot more evenly to the milk, so you avoid scorching the milk and, or anything like that. I mean, this, this is electric, so you always have to, when you're using electric, you always have to be careful about, you know, how hot it can get. Um, but I usually use gas, so it's a little bit easier. You know, that's what I have at home when I make it, but this works. I mean, you know, this works. All right, so we've got the citric acid in, and we are heating up. And I'm still stirring. So anyway, uh, the cheeses then that were made, you know, for extended storage were usually specific to the region. Uh, for example, you have the Alpine cheeses in the uh, Alps, of course, like Swiss. Um, you have the, uh, the English countryside cheeses like cheddar. And then you have, uh, the, what is it, the European lowlands, uh, like, what is it, Dutch, I think, Havarti. All right, so all those, you know, cheeses that you can go and buy or, or have different recipes, a lot of times were made or, um, you know, are based on what's regional. And the whole idea of cheese, the way cheese works in general, is that you're going to, in some way or shape or form, acidify the milk. And I just did that, of course, by adding citric acid. The other way that most of those longer aged cheeses are um, acidified are with a bacteria. And so, for example, uh, cheddar, Colby, Havarti, a lot of those types of cheeses, as well as mozzarella. There is another way to make mozzarella, and that is with culture. Now, when you're using the culture, um, it takes more time because the culture takes a little while to start growing, the bacteria growing, consuming the sugars, creating the acid to lower the pH to make the cheese. And so like typically with making things like cheddar or the other mozzarella or anything like that, it's actually gonna take about an hour or so for the bacteria to do its job and, and acidify the milk to the point where we can use it. All right, so we're heating up pretty well there. I'm just gonna slow that down. And so the other ingredient then, so I've acidified the milk, and if I was making other types of cheeses, the acidification process would be using the bacteria, the culture, and then waiting for a while. Okay. The next ingredient, and really the only other ingredient then, is going to be the rennet. So let me pause here for one minute while I go and get the rennet. No. So this is our rennet, little dropper bottle here. Yeah. Better look at it there. And the way this is, uh, works for me is I have a little cut top. And you usually do it in drops. Uh, for example, I know that 40 drops from this container is half a teaspoon of rennet. And so a lot of times the recipes call for um, a certain amount of rennet. And um, now rennet, okay, so let's talk a little bit about what rennet is. Rennet is basically derived, or at least originally, from the lining of calves' stomachs. So that's the, that's the traditional source for it, because that's, you know, what we're doing, of course, is we are affecting milk. And calves drink milk, and the rennet is part of their digestive process. And what the, the rennet will help to do is basically provide the, the last little stage for turning the milk into the curds that we want. And that's basically all cheese is. When any process that makes cheese is going to create curds, which are basically 
um, a kind of a solidification of, you know, the protein molecules are bonding together, it's trapping more protein, it's trapping some of the fat, and that's why cheese <laughs> is mostly fat and protein. It's not even that sweet. Uh, a lot of the lactose that is in milk is left behind. So the whey is actually a nice, sweet, um, people drink it. I mean, once you're done with the whey, you can drink it. Um, you can use it as a dough conditioner if, you know, for making bread. Uh, you can actually take the whey, continue to heat it, boil it down, and create another type of cheese. So there's a lot of different things that, that whey can be used for. Um, and what we typically do is um, we have pigs. We feed it to them. They love it. They love it. So we're working our way up now to 88 degrees. That's the next point that I'm at. At 88 degrees, I'm basically going to add 10 drops of rennet. So again, typically rennet is diluted. But again, I talked about the fact that this is a very forgiving recipe. And during a demonstration one time, forgot to dilute it and just dropped it right in. And that's, again, not a big deal. So. so 10 drops, so don't need a lot for this recipe. And the, the tradition of diluting it usually comes more from the fact that when cheese is made in very, very large bat, vats or very large containers, um, you know, like literally the size of this table. I mean, in a commercial dairy, they're working with hundreds of gallons of milk. And so they're using this huge vat and rennet, especially for some recipes, can very quickly start to coagulate the milk into the curds, especially if it's, you know, they, you know, they'll dump, you know, a quarter cup of it in or something like that. If you dump that in in one spot, it's so concentrated that the effect is almost immediate and you don't want that. You want the proper effect for making the cheese. So I have my rennet ready to go. So now I'm just waiting for 88 degrees. How are we doing? 77. Okay. Can I ask a really quick go ahead. So um, I've heard that there are vegetable sources. Ah, rennet. you're right. I was, I was still talking about rennet. That's the traditional source. This, this rennet that I have right here, this is actually a vegetable source. Um, there are you know, vegetable-based or non-animal-based, you know, vegetarian rennets, whatever you want to call it. Um, and that's what I have here. Is that, that's what we use. Um, and that actually, I think, is derived from like a, a, some thistle plant of some sort. I'm, I'm not sure the exact process. I mean, that's one of the many things on our list of here's what we'd like to do someday, you know. <laughs> It's pretty far down on the list because there's, there's way too many other things that, that are kind of important. So as you can see, I mean, this is still very liquid, all right? You know, it just runs right through this thing. And I, and I just point that out because when I, very shortly after I add the rennet, as it continues to heat up, that will change. And so that's why I've got the camera focused on that, just so you can see the process. Now, in general, all right, when we go back to all those other cheeses, when you add the rennet, after another set amount of time, it will begin to coagulate. Now that actually has a word for it, it's called flocculation. It's like F-L-O-C-C-A something, right? Flock, you, flock, yeah. Um, and for some, for a lot of the hard cheeses that are made, you actually let that process take place undisturbed and then let it go on depending on the cheese, once the flocculation, which is when it starts to thicken, all right, once that happens, you leave it sit. Typically, for let's say the flocculation takes 10 minutes, you want to leave it set for about four times that. So what develops then is a very large block of curd. So the whole pot, the whole milk, becomes one big solid mass. The whey is still actually trapped within that mass of curd. And then with um, the, the aged cheeses, what you'll then do is the process is referred to as cutting the curds. So you cut the curds in the blocks, which is real hard in a round pot. Well, it's actually not hard. It's easy to do the verticals. The horizontal ones are the hard ones in, a, in this type of pot. But you then cut the curds into cubes. And then Sorry about that. 
And then uh, the curds are then heated. And as they are heated and you're stirring them, they'll slowly shrink, releasing the whey. And then what you end up with by the time you're done is actually something that looks like the small curds. Uh, the best example I can use is cottage cheese. You know, if, if you've seen a, a curdier cottage cheese, that's what you end up. Okay. Now, I, I say that, and I'll talk more about the hard cheese because I have other stuff here as well. Um, but the reason I say that is because what I'm going to do when I'm making this recipe is I'm actually going to stir through the flocculation process. And what that does is basically keeps the big curd from forming and allows the curds to essentially be very small. And then as I continue to heat the milk, they will start to mass together. Because the whole idea of the cheese, of making cheese in general, is once you have the curds, you want to separate the curds from the whey. And there are a number of different processes to do that. And, that's, and I'll talk, I think we're getting close to 88, so I've got to kind of pay attention here. And, and I'll you know, obviously continue to talk about that as we go. So by stirring through that, I kind of, I don't really allow the curds and the, you know, the, the, I don't allow the big mass of curd to form. So I keep it broken up, makes it easier to, to work with, uh, faster, I should say faster to work with. If you're making mozzarella using the, um, the culture, you are actually going to let that happen and you're going to cut the curds and heat it up and, and break it up and, and everything else like that, um, that would normally happen with all the hard cheeses. So again, this is the one I like to make here simply because I can do it in an hour. Some of the hard cheeses that I make, um, they are nearly an all-day process uh, to make a, a hard cheese. So we're up, are we 88 yet? I saw 87. Right? Again, it's very forgiving. I've done it at 87, I've done it at 92. <laughs> it's nice to have recipes that aren't that specific, right? So now, what I want to do is I'll, I'll periodically kind of lift the spoon up just so you can kind of see the process. So it'll take, it'll happen right around 92 degrees or so. And it's really not so much a temperature as a time. So even if I'm late and I put the rennet in at 92 degrees, it still takes a couple minutes. So I don't know how much it's a temperature or it's time. Okay. But what'll happen is, you know, right now, and I know the, the camera is a little bit slower, so it, it looks a little odd anyway, but it's gonna start to thicken, there we go. So it's now it's starting to thicken here and you can start to see it's not rolling off the spoon, okay? So this is how this, so now, you're starting to see the difference, hopefully, okay? Yeah, yeah, exactly, like a mushy oatmeal now, right? And you can see as I pick it up, now you see the curds, all right? And you can see that the curds, if I, if I move them to the side, there's still a little bit of liquid. There we go, that's a good look at them there, okay? So those, so now we have curds and whey. So at this point, there's a lot of things you could do, a lot of things I used to do. Um, I used to stop at this point, and then I would, I would just use the spoon, because this is a slotted spoon. So I would use the spoon to spoon all the curds out into my bowl. And the problem with that is, you have almost a gallon of whey that you're fishing through and trying to look for everything, and I'd always miss a few. And it's like, oh, darn, you know, but I, I like to have everything I can. So, a new technique, and I say this just because, you know, there are a lot of different techniques that you can use. So what I do now is I continue heating to about 105 degrees. Where are we at? 95? What's that? 91. Wow, okay. All right, that's fine. We'll get there. And so I'll continue heating it up to about 105 degrees, and what that'll do then is that'll give enough temperature so the curds will actually start to mat together and stick very easily. If I stop stirring, they also sink. And so what I'll do is get it up to 105, stop stirring, let all those curds sink to the bottom, and then I can just pick the pot up and pour the whey right off, leaving all the curds in the bottom. It's a much faster separation process. Works easier for me. And then I only have to let the curds sit 10 to 15 minutes when I'm doing that. So it works really well. But you get a good look at it. This cottage cheese is about right. Okay. So 
So where was I here? I remember stopping. I was talking about uh, hard cheeses and the curds, right? I think I was talking about cutting the curds and, and heating them up for, the, for the, hard, um, the hard cheeses. So as far as removing the whey, for the mozzarella here, the way we're actually, the way, <laughs> the method we're going to use to actually remove the whey, so I've already got a lot of the whey removed now. I mean, you know, these curds themselves, you know, don't have a lot of whey left in them, okay? What you see here, that's the whey. Now, this is goat milk, and specifically, this is Nigerian dwarf goat milk, which at this time of the year, we just had a milk test, I didn't see the numbers, but at this time of the year, we're running about 6 to 7% butterfat. Now, if anybody's familiar with cow milk, even if you buy whole milk, you're talking 3.5%. That, that is the industry standard. And I say that's the industry standard, and I also said that uh, ours are running... Oh, it's kind of going slow here. All right, put it up a little bit. Um, even cows are different, right? From one cow to the next, from one time of year to the next, from one breed to the next, cow milk is not a constant percentage either. So what dairies actually do is they actually separate the milk and the fat, right? So they basically create skim milk and cream. And then they add in just enough cream to get back to that magic 3.5%. And that's whole milk. If they add only enough to get back to 2%, there's your 2%, or 1%. Or if they don't add any back in, that's your skim milk. And of course, if they have extra cream, or you know, they have leftover cream from the lower percentages, that's what they use then to create their butter, whipped cream, thicker stuff like that. So it's a very process. Now, um, goat milk, the, the Nigerian dwarfs that we use have a much higher butter fat than even other standard breed of goats. And so when, when I do this demonstration with cow's milk, and because and we do this for in a, a certified kitchen so we can actually feed you, I, I can't feed you this because this is not a certified kitchen, obviously. Um, but when you do a certified kitchen and we use the cow's milk, the, the one that I mentioned from the Kilgus, this whey is, a, is almost a clear and has a slightly greenish tint to it. But the, the, the main part is it's clear. Because of the higher butter fat, you can see that this is almost looks a little milky still, right? It's not real clear. And that's just because not all the fat got trapped in the whey, which is fine. But that's, um, that's a difference, you know, uh, just between cow's milk and goat's milk. And like I said, even, not even just any goat milk, but in particular our, our Nigerian dwarf dairy goats. So when you make this, um, if you make this with cow's milk that's only 3.5% butter fat or fat, um, you're going to get a little smaller yield. So for me, one gallon of milk will give me a little bit more than a pound of mozzarella. With cow's milk, you might get about three quarters of a pound. I mean, it's not a lot less, but it is definitely less. And I think this is a tastier uh, as well. How are we doing? We're still going up, right? Oh, good. We're almost there. <laughs> Go ahead. You didn't put any salt in this, right? I have not put any salt in this. Okay. In fact, when I make it, I don't add salt. Okay. You know, one thing I have found with, you know, commercial foods in general, and probably includes cheese, um, it's salty. So, I mean, you could add cheese. I'm sorry, you could add salt. Um, usually with most recipes like this, it says optional. Now when I make a hard cheese, like the cheddar that I typically make, I do add salt to that. And usually when you add the salt, is with the curds. Because you know, if you add the salt to this, most of it's going to stay in the whey. You're not going to get a lot in it. So the, the time to add salt to any cheese is once you have the curds. And so if you do, when, once I separate out the curds, you know, once I get the whey out of here, then you could sprinkle a little salt on and it would be mixed in if you want to do that. Obviously, salt's a preservative. I mean, that, and it, it does add a certain, uh, what, flavor enhancement to it as well. Um, all right, since this is electric, <laughs> I learned my lesson last time. I, I turned it off at 105 and it got a lot hotter on me. So I'll just leave it here and turn it off. All right, so I'll go ahead and kind of spread this out a little bit and let those start sinking to the bottom. So I'll just let this sit here for a little bit, and then um, I'll talk about some of the other things before we go on to the next step. So again, typically, um, I think 15 minutes is what I have done in the past, but 
uh, five to 10 minutes will be plenty. But I talked about the fact that when you make cheese, typically what you want to be able to do is remove the whey from the curds. And so different styles of cheese have different methods of doing that. The way I'm going to do this is, in the end, I'm going to end up kneading it like bread, or it's going to look like Play-Doh when I'm, you know, I'm actually doing it. But that's how I'm going to get all the way out, is by kneading it, heating it. Because this, you know, the mozzarella is going to be heated to a high enough temperature that it's actually going to be stretchy and, and everything else. Other cheeses have different methods. Uh, for example, uh, if you tip, uh, the typical, what most people refer to as goat cheese, is referred to as chef. And that's a different recipe, right? It actually uses the um, mesophilic starter and rennet. A lot less rennet, though. It's like one drop of rennet for a whole gallon of, of the milk. Um, and the way that would be done is you, you add the culture and the rennet at the same time, let it sit for about nine to 10 hours, and then it forms a nice big curd. And actually, after that much time, the whey will start to come out of it a little bit, but it's still one big soft curd. And then you just pour it into a container like this. And if you can see this, uh, yeah, here, we'll go ahead and we can set this off to the side. Let's see how hot this is. Nope, too hot to mess with. All right, we'll just set this down over here. Okay. We'll slide this out of the way. There we go. There we go. That, I don't know where my focus point is here. Somewhere around there? OK. So this container here, it's just a small cup there. And you can see that it has holes in it all the way around. And you'll spoon this in, or spoon the curds in small pieces into here. Just, I just use a spoon and scoop it out as I go. And after about 12 hours or so, gravity will drain all the way. It'll just work its way out of the holes. And you can fill this thing all the way to the top. And by the time you're done, it will have shrunk to about half the size. And so this type of cheese, the chev, is actually still a softer texture. And it's spreadable. It's almost like a, it's almost like a, um, well, it's almost like a spreadable cream cheese, but it has a really nice taste to it. So that is, you know, so, so whey removal with that type of cheese is just gravity and patience. <laughs> patience is the hard part. Um, and there are other types of cheeses as well. So this is another uh, gravity drain style mold. And this one actually puts a nice, pretty little pattern on the bottom. All right. Um, this could be used, and actually we have a, uh, other ones that are a little bit bigger than this that we use for making feta. All right. So when we make feta, it's also a gravity drain. Okay. So we're just using the weight of the whey, or I'm sorry, the weight of the curds and gravity to drain it out. Now, if you make other types of cheeses, for example, you can also take milk and make a, um, an acid type of cheese using vinegar. Or lemon juice is typically, or lime, lemon or lime, a citric juice is typically used for things like um, a paneer, Indian. Um, we use vinegar, and in, we call it queso blanco. Uh, and we like to use um, flavored vinegar because it actually gives it a little bit more of a flavor. Now, when you make that type of cheese, um, you're actually going to heat the milk up to about just short of boiling. And then you pour in, it's an acid, right? You got the, the juices are ac acidic, the vinegar is acidic. And at that temperature, you, all you pour in is that acid. And it coagulates, curdles almost immediately. And really what you're doing is you're curdling the milk. You know, if anybody's ever made or, or add vinegar to milk, it'll curdle even at low temperature, but at high temperature, it forms actual chunky curds. And then you would just put that into cheesecloth. So this is a, um, uh, I think it's a butter muslin is the, uh, the style of it. And for that, you know, you put that into the cheesecloth and you can see how, how tight that weave is. All the curds will stay into here. And then you'll just tie it up in a little ball, hang it in the sink, and again, let gravity drain the way out. And the nice thing about that is, with, at the high temperature, those curds will knit together. But there's one ingredient that I do not add to those cheeses, and that is the rennet. So without the rennet, that cheese is actually not going to melt. So it's a hard cheese. 
but it's really good. I mean, it's, if, uh, if anybody's had tofu, it's very similar to tofu. Um, we, we chop it up in cubes, stir fry it. It's really yummy with like uh, in pasta or anything like that. Um, you can uh, use it in a blender, uh, mix it up with some other stuff, do a risotto. So it's a really good cheese for multi-purpose. And it's a fresh cheese again, and it won't last a long time. Now, if you take the next step though, and you go for the hard cheeses, now you're gonna get the way out with a press. So this is a cheese press. And the idea of this is, basically you have an upper part here. Sometimes you need to remove that. I have a scale on the side here. The bottom part here, spring-loaded. So what this ends up doing, this is basically the mold for it, or the shaper. You'll put your cheesecloth and this would be all sanitized and everything else. But the cheesecloth basically just go into here. I'm usually a lot neater and get all the folds out as much as I can. So then, I talked earlier about the hard cheese. You're going to cut it into curds, and then you're going to heat it up. And as you heat it up, the curds are going to shrink, give up their way, become a little bit firmer. Um, and... Depending on the style of cheese, there's so many different ways to do it. Uh, usually you heat it up at about two degrees every five minutes, and depending on how far you go, will determine the type of cheese. So some cheeses go hotter, you know, uh, there's a thermophilic starter where you start warmer and go even hotter. But for the cheddar I make, I go to about 102 degrees. Sit there for a little while, and then you can do something like uh, a wash curd, where you pour off the whey, add cold water to cool the curds down, or you can leave it hot and let it sit. But in the end, you'll put all the curds into here. And so once the curds are in there, you'll fold that over the top. Neater, of course, but that's the general idea. And then this is our, our follower. This just goes on the top of it there. And of course, that will then press the curds down. And then the gauge here allows me, based on the you know, amount of pressure and how tight I make it, to set the amount of pressure in pounds or the cheese. And for a lot of the hard cheeses, you know, you'll, you'll start at a lower pressure, um, and then every 20 minutes or half hour, you'll take all this apart, pull the whole cheese out, unwrap it, flip it over, fold it back in, put it back in, put the flour back in. You know, so it's a, it's a process. But in the end, you're left with a nice, solid block. The curds all pressed together. Most of the way or pretty much all the way, at that point, has been removed. And so that's, that's the process for hard cheeses. You can then age them, give them some time to develop their flavor. Uh, we were, first time we were making this, we were so impatient, we uh, were like, okay, the, the recipe says that it should be good in, in two to three months. It was like, two-month point, open it up. Eh, not very good. I mean, it was okay, but it had no real flavor. And that's the beauty of aged cheeses, is a lot of them develop their flavor over time. So we have cheddar now, uh, we have one cheddar that's gonna be four years old in October that we're just holding on to and just trying to be patient and letting it age. And I think we've opened, the oldest we've opened so far is about two years. And it was pretty good. <laughs> Deborah's goal is a, uh, I think she wants a nine year. Yeah, that's going to take a while. <laughs> What's that? Oh, when I, uh, this, this particular press here will make a two-pound block. So, two pounds. Yeah, yeah. These are, uh, this mold is the one I use typically because this, um, for cheddar, again, with the butter fat changing through the year, I will use anywhere from, uh, when it gets really high in the winter, I'll need only 12 pounds of milk to make a two pound block of cheddar. Um, in the summer when it's hot, the butter fat's lower, I may need 14 or 15 pounds of milk to make a two pound block. But my goal is usually a two pound block because that what's, that's what fits in here. And for this, particular, um, for this particular scale, you can see that you know, with the threads, I've only got a small range to work. So if, if, this is, if this is too skinny, I can't get to the upper pressure. If it's too much, too big, then it's hard to even get this thing on in the first place. I have actually had this thing filled with curds up to here 
when I misjudge how much milk to use. And so, the, you know, it's like, it usually it presses fairly quickly, and so the initial pressure, instead of being the recommended 20 pounds, might have been 30 for a little while, and then once all the curds start to press together, not a big deal. Okay. So now, what I'm going to go ahead and do is pour off the whey. And so with this, I'm going to kind of pour it so you can, you can kind of see here what happens. I have to take this home for the pigs, otherwise they won't, you know. So you can see all the mass of curds there on the bottom. Okay, and they're all sticking together pretty well there. The more way that I can get out before I start kneading, the, uh, the neater it's going to be. All right, so now we'll have some very happy pigs tonight. We have some of the best fed pigs around. <laughs> so now I have that mass of curds. Okay? And then I call it a mass because I can literally just pick it up like that. So now we'll just go ahead and, and I'm just going to do this in here because it can be a little splattery. You can kind of see the, the way coming off there. Now, the temperature of this is only about 100 degrees. When I start heating it up, it will get hotter. Um, you can just have a dedicated pair of kitchen gloves that you can use. I can usually, I can usually move this fast enough and, and do it at just enough temperature that I don't have to... Uh, to use gloves, and I clean my hands, so it's for home use. If I, if I do this as a demo with, in, a, in a great, you know, in a, a certified kitchen with the certified milk, then I'll use the gloves, but you guys don't get to taste this, so I'm just going to use this at home. <laughs> okay. So you can see now, you can still see the, kind of the individual curds, you know, kind of the outline of them, so that's mostly because it's not real high a temperature yet, but I've got to the point now where I, don't have too much more whey coming out. And you can probably, if you see this, the, the color of this, this almost looks like milk again. And the, the more whey you get out, the longer this will last. If you, if you don't get all the way out, you end up with like a small pocket of whey, um, it won't last quite as long in the fridge as you might like. Okay. If this is easier in a kitchen. I just rinse off in the sink, but I just brought lots of paper towels. So this is where the microwave comes in. Again, this is the easier, quicker way to do it. Um, and you, no, actually what you would do, let me, let me get this going and I'll, I'll talk about what you, no, that's fine. Uh, that one, okay. The other option you have, instead of using a microwave, is to just go ahead and put the whey back in the pot, heat it up. Now that I have the mass of curds, it's not really gonna absorb the whey, but now you can heat it up in the way. And so what that'll do is that's another method of doing it. Because what you want to do is you want to get it up to a temperature of about 130 to 140 degrees. And at that point, that is when it becomes stretchable. And so the microwave does that very quickly. But you could just use the pot of whey that you just used and do it that method. Now, at that temperature, and, and again, with the microwave, I can kind of get away with, um, you know, doing it by hand. But when you have it in way, if you're doing it that way, what you could do is just use a couple of spoons to kind of knead it and massage it together to kind of force the way out. And then, you know, go through the method that, that I'm going to go through here in a little bit. Can now, go ahead. I've never done it actually in the way. No, I've always used the microwave. <laughs> Yeah, I don't think there would be much difference, though. I really don't. Because, again, the whole idea is to get the way out. Okay. So now that I've heated this, you can actually see a little bit of whey. And you can see now this is also a lot stretchier, right, as I, as I kind of do that. It's actually pretty hot. So the first part I do usually use a spoon for. And so all I'm going to do is just kind of knead it. Oops, yeah, that's good. I usually have a solid spoon and forgot to, to bring it. So the, slot, the slotted spoon makes a little bit more of a challenge. But you can see how the, the cheese actually pressed right through the holes in some of the areas where it's fairly hot. 
So I'm just going to keep kind of kneading it around there. And as I do that, you can see there's a little bit more whey that's coming out. And this also helps distribute the, the heat a little bit better. We all know that microwaves are not uh, known for, very, for being a nice, even distributor when you, when you heat them up. So you can see I'm leaving the imprint. You can also start to see now the surface of the cheese, right, especially in the spots where it's hotter, and I've already kind of massaged it there, is nice and smooth. Okay, Some areas here, you can still see a little bit of the outline of the curds. And as I, so as I continue to do this, it'll be more and more smooth as I go through. And so I, I can do this for a little while. And then once I have the heat fairly evenly distributed, you see how nice and smooth that is. Once the, uh, the heat is a little bit more distributed, then I can usually handle it by hand. And again, the bowl has a little bit of whey on it, and what I would normally do, oops, what I normally do is just rinse that underneath the sink. <laughs> but instead, we just use our alternative here, which is a paper towel to kind of wipe it out. I mean, my whole goal is to remove the whey. The last thing I want to do is go ahead and put more back in. Oh yeah. Oh yeah, you can drink it. You know, you can make more cheese out. So now, let me just, uh, so. <laughs> so you can actually see how, how this stretches out now, right? That's your goal. I mean, that's, that's a good, good mozzarella stretch, and it's a good temperature. I can, it's hot. I mean, it's hot. I mean, you can, I don't know if you can see the steam coming off it in here. I don't see it, so that's pretty good. Okay. But once it's stretchy like that, that means you're in a good position. You've got all the way out. If, if you don't have enough way out initially, and usually it would take a couple things for me if I did it the old way, you know, where I used to scoop it out and take time, and there'd be a lot more whey coming out of the bowl. Um, what will happen, let me see if I can find a spot here. Oh, that's actually pretty good. What will happen is as you start to stretch it, it'll break. You know, just boom. And so when it's breaking, it's, you know, you still got too much whey in it, or possibly it's not hot enough. So that's, you know, part of the microwave, part of learning. Oh, here we go. You can see, like, kind of right in there, right, right in there, it's not as smooth as like the back side. Um, but whey can also be used to make uh, bread. I, I mentioned a dough conditioner. So as a dough conditioner, uh, it works really well to help, uh, I think, help with the gluten in, in, in bread. And so we use it for that as well. So it's starting to cool off. As it starts to cool off, it's going to get a little firmer, a little harder to stretch. Okay. But you're just basically making sure you got all the way out of it. Which I'm, I'm, I'm quite comfortable I'm at that point. So what's going to happen now is I'm going to kind of squeeze it in back into a nice shape here, nice kind of a ball, and it, it'll mold itself back together as long as it's hot enough. So that's generally why it goes back in the microwave for just a, another, oh, and the first time I microwave, and this is, well, it's one of the learning curve things, um, is that you must know your microwave. <laughs> Microwaves come in different powers. A small one like this is probably only about seven or 800 watts. You've got a big installed one, it might be 1,000 to 1,200 watts. That's a lot of difference. And so, like my home one, I know that one minute gets it just about right the first time. 30 seconds works really well the second time. This one's a little wimpier, all right? And I've been actually, uh, one kitchen I did, I think it must have been almost 1,500 watts because I did it for my minute and it was so hot that I couldn't even come close to handling the cheese, and it was so s smooth and soft, it was just rolling all over the place, and you couldn't even do anything with it for a while. But it didn't ruin it. It just, you know, made it difficult. So I've, uh, I've heated it up for another 30 seconds or so, and I can feel it. It's hot. It's nice. But what I'm doing all now is I'm just kind of, you know, kneading it and forming it and shaping it, you know, where the little seams are there, trying to smooth it out and get it into a, a nice flat shape here. Because the last step is to basically put it in ice water. Because now I'm all done with it. I've got all the whey removed. It's all nice and pliable there and everything. And by putting it in the ice water, what that will do is cool off quickly. And so that'll help it maintain the shape that I want. Now, 
options, right? At this point, if you, uh, um, you know, I, I, I do it like this because this is how I'm going to store it, right? Uh, I can do a pound or I can cut it in half and do half a pound or whatever I want to do. But at this point, you could have taken and, and like pinched off little balls or maybe pull off a chunk and roll it into a, a kind of a, a log shape to make like a, a string cheese, you know, a little chewable cheese thing, or pinched off little balls, dropped it in the ice water to have little snacks. You could store it in a way too, right? You could potentially store it in a way. I, I don't know if I'd do that as much with mozzarella though. What, what is it like when you get an Italian grocery, what do you do that? That might be a, a, maybe a diluted way. Yeah, or they put it in water, and what can happen over time is the whey will continue to leach out, and that'll, that'll kind of, you know, um, color the water a little bit. Yeah, because like some cheeses, like the feta, you know, when you, when you do the feta, we actually brine that, or you can brine it. There are other cheeses, let's say the Havarti, I think. So, so again, you know, when you get done with your hard cheese, you take it out of the mold, you can either dry it, or you can brine it, which helps salt it and dry it out a little more quickly. And then once it's hardened enough, you wax it and then you store it. Now this again, this is a fresh cheese, so this needs to be used within about a week or so. Or freeze it and keep it for a long time. Okay? Wow, I'm done. And it's quarter after. Questions? Go ahead. Yeah. That's what we, we found works best. You know, I mean anything with a ziplock. No, see that's the thing. With the ice water here, remember how soft it was. Yeah. Once it cools, it's gonna be solid. Okay. I mean, well, you know, not solid, solid, but yeah. firm. <laughs> firm enough that you could, I mean, I'll, I'll do this. Right, right, exactly. And, and I mean, in an hour, you know, or actually, you know, this, this, the beauty of ice water is because water is such a good conductor of heat, this cools it down more quickly. I mean, could I have just put it on a plate and stuck it in the fridge? I could have, but, it, it might, because of the slower heat transfer, it might actually kind of soften and flatten a little bit and, and whatnot. But with this, you know, um, a, after just a minute or so, I'll just flip it over here. Get the, you know, because it sinks to the bottom, so the, you know, the, the, all the cold is on top here. But the, um, it'll have cooled off enough uh, that it will stay firm. And I usually just put it in the fridge, you know, for a few hours flip it over for you know, a few more hours. At that point, you cut it in half, do the freezer bag, and it'll be firm enough. It will maintain its shape. And I, you know, I, I just, I've, I've really come to love freezer bags for so much stuff because they, it will, it, stuff will last for a long, long time. Any other questions? Yeah, yeah. I, we haven't noticed any significant difference between them. And I, you know, we've accidentally pulled out some that were almost a year and a half old. It's like, well, but, and as long as it still has its seal, it's wonderful. There's yeah. not a lot of water left in it. There is very little. Water. No. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and you've removed this really well. It, you know, um, once I, when I pull it out of the water, I'll just, you know, take paper towels, kind of pat it dry, and then just stick it in the fridge on a plate to help finish cooling. For you, that's all it will be, yeah, yeah. Now, like I said, we, um, in the store out there, we, have, we actually have uh, cheesecloth for sale. We have citric acid. Uh, well, we have rennet. I gotta get the rennet out there. Just, I think the rennet is, is just in a little bottle like this. Um, and then we have, um, we have four things. What did I say? Citric acid. Oh, sorry, we don't have milk. <laughs> culture, yes, there was culture. There is some mesophilic culture out there as well. So mesophilic culture and rennet is all you need to make a hard cheese. I mean, ideally, you'll have a nice press as well. That's a little harder to get. <laughs> we don't sell those, sorry. Um, when you buy these, when you buy these, there are, you can buy something that is just a single bolt. And so there is no reading out. And so then you're just kind of going, well, you know, based on the, the torque I'm putting here and the angle of the screw, I guess I'm putting about, you know, there is no good way to do it. I mean, how'd they do it in the old days? Well, that, that's part of the tradition, right? You know, you, you have a family that did it, and they say, like, that rock right there for 20 minutes, it's rock on. And so, you know, there would be traditions that would identify those different, you know, amount of pressing weights and, and times and things like that. Yeah, I, um, I, have, a, I have a group called Blaze Press Masonry, so um, uh, they actually like that. Okay. So I, yeah. I mean, you know, the amazing thing is, I mean, this is nothing more 
than a six inch PVC pipe that has been cut. Because I have another press that has a four inch pipe and that will make about a one pound block of cheese. So, <laughs> different ways to do it. Any other questions? Yes, actually, when you when you put this together, when I put oh, when, I put, when you put this together, when you put this on on top like this, you actually, when you tighten this down, you don't want to tighten this part down. To use it for pizza in a good day or two here. <laughs> All right, great.